I'm one of three public engagement coordinators based in UCL's public engagement unit. Um, my job is to inspire you on this hot day. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of um, online public engagement from other disciplines within UCL and then ask my colleague Joe Flatman from the Institute to think about how some of those lessons could perhaps be applied within the realm of archaeology. Okay, to start with perhaps clarification of what UCL means by public engagement, because it's one of those terms that gets bandied around. Um, essentially, we mean, my role and that of my colleagues is to help create a culture of two-way conversations between academic and research staff and people outside the university. And um, the official definition includes talking, listening and being prepared to change. It's been stratified into six different um, types of activity and only one of them is a one-way direction of conversation, that's the telling public groups about our work. And as you'll read through, you'll see there's an increasing amount of two-way dialogue and the one we really want to encourage people to aim at is creating knowledge in collaboration with communities and interest groups outside the university. So I've tried to choose some projects which really illustrate the, the pinnacle that we want you to get to. Okay, uh, the next thing to say is, um, in the unit, we think that online, good public engagement, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, have exactly the same ingredients. You need to be really clear about your target audience. There is no such thing as the general public. Um, you need to be clear why you're going to invest all this time. What do you want to get out of it? What will you get out of it? What will your audience get out of it? And very important, do a reality check. Everyone's been talking about the amount of time it takes. We get so many applications saying, I'm going to build a website, I'm going to change the world, but they really are not going to have time to do it. So a lot of the advice we give is work with a smaller group and do less better, and you'll get more out of it. And we have a full-time evaluation officer in our unit, and a lot of the advice we give is don't do anything until you've worked out how you're going to know if you're actually having an impact. Um, we recruited, we expanded recently. I'm new and my colleague Kimberly Freeman is new and we were specifically recruited because we have a mix of expertise. Um, I'm a complete online ingenue, I put my hands up now, and my expertise is in face-to-face -face engagement, particularly with underrepresented groups. But Kimberly is a real online whiz, and I wish she wasn't on holiday today. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what I wanted to say was that we, um, as, a, as a public engagement unit, we really want to see people thinking about how their online engagement fits with their face-to-face -face activity. And you'll see in the projects I've chosen that they really go hand-in-hand -hand to create communities and ongoing relationships. And the best way is to think of them as, as working hand-in-hand. Okay, so on to some inspiration. I've chosen three projects. One from museums and digital humanities, uh, which is really challenging the hierarchy of knowledge within the museum context. Scandinavian studies, it's a tiny department. There are only six or seven um, staff, but they're absolutely storming in terms of public engagement. And they really show us how to create an audience completely from scratch and to set it within a very interdisciplinary framework, which I think could be interesting for archaeology. And finally, UCL Laws, a much larger scale project, but has actually found a way to allow non-academics to contribute to new areas of research. The first one I'm going to speak about, as already been mentioned, it's Curator. A lot of you will have heard of it. As the name <coughs> suggests, Curator is all about challenging the concept of who can be a curator in a museum concept. Um, it's a collaboration at UCL between three disciplines, the Centre for Digital Humanities, CASA, which is the Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis, and UCL Museums and Collections. It's currently been in use in two museums, the Grant Museum of Zoology and uh, Petrie Museum of Egyptology. And if you haven't been, please go and check it out. So how does it work? Um, it's powered by technology developed by CASA, which um, enabled physical objects to be catalogued online. But what the curator team did was they thought, let's throw some QR codes into the mix. Let's give individual museum objects their own QR code, essentially their own Twitter feed, and link it to that online database. So what happens if you actually go to the museum? If you go to the Grant Museum today, 
um, you will see an iPad next to a specific exhibit with um, a, a question chosen. I'm not sure how long they have the questions on display. I think it's a rolling program, maybe it changes weekly or monthly. You can choose to engage with that literally by typing into the iPad. If you've got the technology, you can swipe the QR code and interact with your own phone. And you can also engage with it online later and share the conversation with your friends and colleagues. So it's really changing who is creating that living label that lives in the museum and who can take part in the dialogue. Another thing that's been interesting is this is an example from the Grant Museum. They've actually taken on the challenge of using this technology to engage with taboo topics that museums sometimes choose to shy away from because it's just too difficult. So here we've got a question um, asking whether museums should study biological differences between races <coughs> and a few of the comments that museum visitors posted on that day. Um, but really what it shows us is that this technology, this online engagement, is changing the museum from what has historically often been a very passive experience to a place of experimentation, dialogue and debate. And I'm delighted to say that last week, um, this is the curator um, team, they won a Museum and Heritage Innovation Award um, and they are proudly displaying their own QR codes on their arms. So congratulations <laughs> to them, it's a really big coup for them. How do you put a QR code on someone's arm? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on to something completely different. How many people actually recognise this image? Just oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. I've been greatly enjoying it. Okay, this project is from Scandinavian Studies. It's Nordic Noir. This is a still from BBC Four's latest big hit Scandinavian crime drama called The Bridge. I've chosen it um, because just as BBC4 has captured a whole slice of the UK population's imagination, so the Scandinavian Studies Department <coughs> has done the same thing by approaching public engagement through literature and drama. They asked themselves the question, we're a very small esoteric area of study, and, and also the Scandinavian Studies has been cut, swathes of it have disappeared around the country, so they really need to get themselves out there and create interest. So they ask themselves, where does popular interest in our subject already lie? And the answer for them was people reading Scandinavian crime fiction in translation, and latterly, people watching these crime dramas. So the way they went about it um, was to think, how do we capture the interest of that group of people using both online and face-to-face -face engagement methods to broaden their understanding of our area? So they've used a blog, uh, I think they started weekly and now only have to do it monthly, um, a Facebook page and a very active Twitter account combined with a whole series of interdisciplinary events to successfully attract an audience that UCL honestly really struggles with, which is your 25 to 35 year old bright young things in London, professionals. We don't really have much conversation with them as a university. Um, so the kind of events that they've organised, for example, they invited the Icelandic author, forgive my pronunciation, Ursa Sigurdotter, to come and talk about her latest crime novel, and also asked someone from UCL Hazard Centre to talk about the cultural and geological impact of living in a country where volcanoes are a big deal. Um, this is what they've achieved so far. Um, the reason why it's, re I mean, it's much smaller scale than a lot of things that we've heard about today, but they know they are genuinely having an impact and creating interest and real two-way dialogue. The reason they think it's worked is because they've worked as a team. They brainstorm ideas for the next events together, who to bring in from other disciplines. They've combined online and face-to-face -face very successfully, and each event is sort of self-perpetuating. And they very much respond to demand. So their Twitter followers said, actually, we would like a proper book club, not just these different events, we'd actually like a reading group. And when uh, <coughs> the previous crime drama came on, people wanted a Borgen briefing, so they put on an event um, looking at coalition politics. OK, on to something very different. Um, is this engaging? How would, how would you actually use this to, to attract a new audience? Um, the answer is in someone who you will probably, most people will recognise this, I hope. If not, this is Jeremy Bentham. This is his auto icon, which you can go and visit in UCL South Cloisters. 
And this project is based in UCL laws. It's called the Transcribed Bentham Project. <coughs> it's much larger scale and it has, has had um, quite high levels of funding from the AHRC. Um, but what it has really managed to do is to find a way to create a space for um, non-academic members of the public to contribute to research. The aims of Transcribed Bentham were threefold. One, to speed up um, publication of his complete works. I think there will be 75 volumes in total. They've been going since 1950 and they're on about number 30. Um, to create a free and accessible depository of all Jeremy Bentham's papers. And finally, to engage a new audience in Bentham's ideas, which are thought to have um, new contemporary resonance. So how does it actually work? Basically, as, a, as a, um, someone interested in Bentham's idea, you can come to the trans Transcribed Bentham website, you can register as a transcriber, and you can actually access an online manuscript and actively transcribe it. Click send and it's saved. A member of the Transcribed Bentham project will come back to you with feedback, and there have actually been examples of people uncovering um, new and innovative areas uh, um, not previously known about Bentham. Um, one example I know of, um, he's a big advocate of human rights, and one transcriber found an example of him being told off by a servant who had caught him burning earwigs in a candle. So, you know, that, that transcriber will actually be noted as, a, as an co-author on that paper, and they actually get the recognition. Um, I think we skipped a slide, but never mind. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's not there. This is what they know about their transcribers. Um, how they attracted them, um, it was a mixture again. They did print flyers, they distributed them locally in libraries and bookshops, but again, they did need some clout to really get this off the ground. And their biggest way of attracting people is they had a New York Times article, a Sunday Times online article, and they have a lot of people in the US and, and globally. Okay, I think I will finish there. Um, these are the uh, links if you'd like to look it up. If anyone has any questions for me at a later date about their own public engagement ideas, please do get in touch, and I'll hand over to Joe. <laughs> Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, which I apologise, but I will be brief. Uh, the first thing I'd say is, is completely unscripted, actually, which is an answer to, to Hugh's question of where's all the humour gone. There's a workshop being chaired by myself and Henry Oradon this very evening on Saturday, to which I would encourage you to attend. It hadn't crossed my mind, but we ought to really come up with a pithy uh, hashtag so there can be some sort of online engagement with it, so I shall discuss this with Hilary. But it's entirely free and it is in here. Um, uh, and we will attempt to make it cooler uh, from when we're in here. Uh, because it is a very good question. Why, why is archaeology not being as funny? As those of you who haven't gone to see the, the Yelvis, what, uh, Elvis with a Y, a type of Elvis Stonehenge, uh, there is a video treat awaiting you. I'll tell you no more. I want to focus in on four particular issues in relation to the Institute of Archaeology and public engagement. And some of these are broader public engagement issues. I will attempt to focus in primarily on... Um, uh, online issues. And I apologise, my voice, uh, like a number of people's, my allergies are killing me. Uh, <coughs> Pardon me. The first issue is the question of what I would call both strengths and weaknesses of the Institute, and they will be familiar to many of you. One of them is the fact that we have this whacking great building here, which is an enormous strength and an enormous weakness. And indeed, our biggest problem, I put it to you, uh, in terms of public engagement generally, but particularly pub online public engagement, is there are so many of us in this building doing so many wonderful things. The problem is actually translating that, or perhaps, let's rephrase it, boiling that down. And it follows on from a number of the different points I've heard people presenting about today. This issue of how do you actually get uh, a focus on this. We do not in the institute have one dedicated person doing online engagement. We have one or two people who do rather more than others, Charlotte Frearson is largely in charge of most of our online engagement. Charlotte has many other jobs. Uh, so one of the real questions for the Institute going forward, as it is for so many organisations, is how do you distill down that quality of so many different people and, and, and give a message which is both consistent but yet not off-putting and not boring and, and, and dry. Alongside that, we therefore have a number of other questions. 
one of which is the number of different themes and threads within this, in this institute, and are there particular ones we ought to be focusing on? As I sit in this room, I think of the fact that we have an awful lot of work in heritage studies, which technically is some of the most important work we are doing, I would suggest. It is the area of the most potential for engagement with the widest number of other stakeholders, government, uh, local government, central government, industry, questions of how do we measure and value and manage heritage. However, when we look at other public audiences, those are generally the areas which I will be honest are of least interest to them. You ask the average punter walking up Tottenham Court Road today what they are interested in archaeology and the influence of the National Planning Policy Framework or the new National Heritage Protection Plan is <coughs> likely to be low on their list. So how do we find uh, things like Nordic Wild nor where are our archaeology's uh, kind of key themes, key threads where we can take them? Well, one area is very much like some of the projects presented here, uh, various different collections. And as, uh, as, as Laura was saying, uh, um, questions of interdisciplinary relationships should surely come high on our, on our agenda, particularly our ongoing questions of how do we actually get out there and promote our own collections within inside the Institute. This then stems onto my second point, and that is sort of some questions of issues. How do we actually start to get engaged with groups? And in particular, how do we get the right balance between actual on-the-ground activities here in the Institute or elsewhere in London where we're physically giving out? How do we develop our online projects? And from that, some, uh, the, the biggest question which really comes up is how do we actually understand our demographics? One of the real problems with the Institute right now, I, I, I will put our hand up to that, is that we don't really understand who is looking at us online and how we are communicating with them. We are doing more and more online engagement. We have Twitter feeds from various different staff. We have a particular 75th anniversary Twitter feed. We have a whole host of different web resources in various different ways and Facebook accounts and things like that. But there is very, very little analysis of the demographics of that. One of the things we are most certain of, though, is that we more regularly reach people far further afield, I mean literally internationally far further afield, <coughs> than we ever do the local community. I'm not going to water everywhere, I'm breaking things, I'm terribly sorry. So we have a real question there, that on the one hand we have an enormous audience here in London who we are least engaging with, and we have a massive international audience. Well, we want to engage with both, but we could run the very real risk of uh, disenfranchising one while we attempt to go after another. This comes on to uh, some of my third and fourth final points. Well, one of the realities the Institute has been coping with over the last few years is that while we do very well in certain areas, we are not, to use a very, very worn out phrase, punching above our weight in terms of the overall university. Uh, we could and we should have more potential with this amazing resource, with these amazing numbers of people. So my final point are some, some question marks uh, in relation to, to, to Laura's presentation, in relation to a number of other presentations, of where we are going now and where we might go as an institute. The first point is that if you, well this is, let me, I'll, I'll do engagement with you. Who's aware that we're doing lots of stuff to do with our 75th anniversary? Most people, but not everyone. You see, the shocking fact is anyone sitting in this room should have been made aware of it, the fact that it's our 75th anniversary. We're having an enormous push on this. And if you're not, my question mark comes in my head, how will we fail to communicate to you? Because I think that's very much our failure rather than yours. Well, we have this 75th anniversary going on, and that means an awful lot of online engagement. It means an awful lot of formal physical engagement here on campus and elsewhere in London. But how do we build upon that social network we created, that physical network and that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, online network? In relation to that, we have, for instance, seen enormous use of Twitter, almost entirely because I'm going to add again, Charlotte Brisson. I'm going to keep saying, Charlotte Brisson's a very good thing, because once she's a good friend of mine, too, she is a very good thing. And I also think that she ought to be given a more opportunity to follow up being a very good thing. Uh, also, she will then be very happy with me. Um, so we have this issue of she's already doing things with the use of Twitter in particular and the use of the IOA 75th hashtag. Well, how again do we build on that kind of area? How then in particular do we integrate or do we start collaborating with some of the other departments of the university where we have natural linkages? Uh, these are some of the issues we are dealing with. A couple of other points I, I have, and it ultimately comes back to something which I think comes time and time again in all of the presentations I've heard of. How do you 
come down, I, I said at the beginning, how do you distill down that multiplicity of voices <coughs> into one voice? Do you even want to distill down? Do we want to have the voice of the ancient of archaeology or the many different voices? And if we do have the many different voices, how do we actually do that? Are there ways in which we as staff, or we as students, or we as a, a corporate body ought to be thinking about that? Um, for the staff in particular, uh, there is obviously always the issue of yet more time, nit or not. And, and Hugh raised an interesting point that he's experiencing in English heritage of people uh, are focusing on their books. Well, in English heritage, that's certainly one problem, and I can see uh, the particular circumstances for that type of organisation. In the university, particularly in, the uni uh, in a research intensive university like UCL, the simple answer is books win ref points, and ref points mean that you do well. If I don't submit well in this ref, it's quite simply, I won't be fired, but I'll be severely disciplined, shat upon, and uh, unlikely to see any significant promotion. I can't produce that, and that is true of so many staff. So there is a natural focus <coughs> towards uh, those visible, those highly visible uh, publications. How we break that cycle, not just in archaeology, but in many, uh, well, in all academic spheres, uh, is specifically <coughs> on the way to me, and I think I should probably shut up at that point, because I'm aware I've made a run. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.